MSNBC spoke to some 2016 Trump voters in swing states. And um, let's just say that 2020 isn't looking nearly as good for Trump with these swing voters in these swing states as it was last time. They find themselves unsure of where to turn. NBC's Dasha Burns caught up with some moderate Republican voters in Kent County, Michigan, as part of our County to County series. The last time you and I met, Katie, was in March. Right. At that time, you and your husband were both working full time. Your kids were in school. How has your life changed since then? How has my life changed? Well, I mean, we went through, obviously, the kids not going to school to trying to work from home, to try to educate our children from home as well, and uh, trying to, to balance, you know, the cancellation of, of life, essentially. How has your political life, political landscape changed? I'm, I'm turning into more of an angry person than I think I've ever been in my entire life, and that makes me really sad. I'm just on a countdown to November right now, and hoping uh, our, we wake up from this nightmare we're living in. Hal, when you and I first met, you had a term you used right. for your political identity. Politically homeless. How have the stakes changed since we first met? I, I think we're seeing it on a daily basis, this delegitimizing of, of you know, pillars of our society, of institutions of government, um, everything from um, COVID testing to uh, choices that we've got to make about education for our kids. And this, there's just a, a void of, of leadership at the top. Jerry, I think you are still probably furthest to the right of, of this group. When we first met at the farmer's market, you were echoing a lot of the president's language. You called impeachment a witch hunt. You, what made you go from pretty solidly for Trump to backing away from that and now winding up more on the fence. Some of the his statements, some of the buffoonery uh, at times I saw some of the shenanigans, uh, his, his actions. Um, and also, you know, when when he said that, you know, well, we're just going to knock this right down. Well, that's not, that ain't going to happen. What do you think he should have done differently? Not had it so blase blase like, yeah, this, you know, we'll take care of this. The bravado, the bravado would be a that, that's kind of irking me right now at this point. And you, you did vote for Donald Trump in 2016. Mm -hmm. You thought he, uh, his business background, he could be a leader that could really bring America forward in, in various ways. How has this crisis made you think differently, not just about the president, but in general about what, what leadership should look like and how important it is? The business man ideal was what was, I think, the attraction, you know, there. Um, and if I can see that from the leaders of the, the company I work for to, um, you know, all across corporate America, there's no reason the guy in the White House can't do it. The president, both both candidates are looking at the suburbs. They, they want to win over suburbs like the ones here in Kent County. The president has been campaigning on this law and order message in places like this. Mm -hmm. Is that resonating? I Katie? think it's I think it's gonna backfire. I, I think that the type of law and order that he thinks he's promoting is not the type of law and order that resonates with suburban voters. You know, you're right. These aren't we aren't, you know, suburban moms, we aren't nineteen fifties housewives anymore. We're educated, strong women who are trying to raise families while working full time out of the home. You know, a lot of us are and to make us think that we're gonna be, you know, this, you know, defund the police thing, and we're gonna all of a sudden be overrun in our communities by all these bad people is, is ludicrous. Yeah, that was basically everything I thought it would be. So th these are Republicans, like moderate Republicans who in 2016 voted for Trump. Um, they're in a swing state. And now they just don't feel like they did back then. And if you look, I jotted down their uh, their list of reasons here because this these are this is echoing themes that I've kind of brought up in different contexts over the past couple months on this show. Um, they said one of them said, "I'm angry. I'm angrier than I've ever been." Uh, they said. There's this delegitimizing of the government going on that they're uncomfortable with. 
where it does appear to be like Trump versus some of the agencies. Like, for example, with the CDC, he mandated that the coronavirus information, the data, go to his administration as opposed to right to the CDC. So I see no other reason to do that other than to cook the books and change the numbers. This was a big story a few weeks ago. It looks like these little things are adding up for people. One of them cites um, COVID testing. How the, you know, the COVID testing was totally botched. Uh, schools, how there's this push now from Trump and his administration to force people to go back to schools when, you know, I just saw this story last night. There was a school in Georgia that went viral because there were really crowded hallways. This is during a pandemic and very few masks. Well, guess what? Nine people in the school had COVID and then now they just switched to all online the other day. But like, like, of course that this is what was going to happen. Of course this was going to happen. But Trump and his people are just trying to force everything back to normal. And they, people are watching this like, not my kid, bro. Not my kid. You ain't doing this to my kid. You're not going to do this to us. So it's, it's backfiring then I think some of the most important ones, um, void of leadership. This gets back to a point that I made that in times where there's acute crises, you want to, you want somebody who's in charge, who's a steady hand of leadership. Because you just want, I think in most people's minds, in, in times of crisis, they actually do want to feel like there is no politics involved in the decision making. It's just like, almost like when you're a kid, you fall on the playground, you scrape your knee. You want like an adult figure to come over, calm you down, fix the problem, maybe wash the knee off, put a little ointment and a band-aid or something, but like calm you down the entire time and just kind of show that leadership. It's a similar thing for an entire country during a time of crisis. You want a steady hand of leadership. You don't want somebody who's a bomb thrower, who's divisive, who's going to pick a side and, and add fuel to the fire. You just want somebody to come along who's like, um, we're going to take care of this. We're going to take care of this. I got it under control. And we got your back, Americans. We're going to do the right thing. And I, I told you that Trump's persona is populist bomb thrower. And that works when there's not multiple acute crises. But when there are multiple acute crises, people don't want like the loud, swashbuckling, arrogant person. They want the person who's going to step up and be like, listen, everybody, breathe, breathe. We're going to get through this as a country and we're going to do everything that we have to do. And you can rest assured we're on top of it. And that's just not in Trump's personality. He's not the kind of person who brings people together. He's the kind of person who divides people, takes a side. Um, one of them says, I'm sick of the buffoonery and the, and the shenanigans. That's another thing. I think that that stuff could be appealing in, in a context where, you know, you got all these like stuck up politicians who are just like too proper and too professional. Like the professional stuff gets boring. You want to like switch it up a little bit and have somebody who's a little bit of a clown, willing to say whatever, have no filter. But then when you get hit with the crisis, all of a sudden you're like, where are the professionals at? We need professionals. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Um, one of them mentions that, oh, the appeal in 2016 to me was that he was like a businessman. So I think that that, uh, you know, the person saying like, I think that that would have been good for the country to have like a businessman run the country. This is something you hear a lot. You hear different versions of this argument that like, oh, we need to run this country like a business. But I don't think that was ever really a good idea because the whole idea of a business is you want to turn a profit for the country. It's almost like the exact opposite. You're not trying to, you know, personally benefit in any way, shape or form. What you're trying to do is have a thriving, peaceful, stable, fair society in a way that you, again, that's the opposite in many ways of just trying to turn a profit like you would for a business. So I never really agreed with the businessman um, point that people make. Uh, and then the final thing is the law and order thing isn't resonating. It's not resonating. Just like I told you guys, it wasn't going to resonate because you can't have a guy who wrote the crime bill. 
You can't have a guy who's tough on crime his entire political career and then turn around and say, that guy is soft on crime. Because it's just, it's too much of a leap. It's, it's too, it's too clearly untrue. Like, anybody's going to look at that and say, I don't, that's not, Joe Biden doesn't strike me as somebody who's like cheering on looters and rioters. That's not, that's not a thing. You're kind of making that up. And they are. And so it's not resonating. And they said, like, you, you're treating, one of them said, you're treating us like we're 1950s housewives. We're not that. We're not that. We're like professionals, educated women trying to provide for our families. And it's, and we're struggling because you haven't gotten the virus under control, which means the pandemic is still raging and the economy is still in tatters. So it, you have to fix the virus and the economy. Like, that's the thing. You could say law and order all you want. Things don't feel very law and order-like when homelessness massively spikes. There are evictions everywhere. Five million people have had COVID. Over 160,000 deaths. You know, a 20% real unemployment. Things don't feel very law and ordery. And you could try to scare people about, like, rioters and looters in the streets. But that is not as direct a threat to people and a problem in people's minds as the virus is and the economy is. It's the economy, stupid. It's the healthcare system, stupid. And just remember, about 30 million people have lost their health insurance under Trump's presidency. Good luck having that happen under your presidency and then running and getting reelected. As I said a million times, you could run a ham sandwich against Trump at this point, and the ham sandwich would probably win. Because the ham sandwich... There weren't 30 million people who lost their health insurance under the ham sandwich. That happened under Trump. And steadily rising, by the way, that number is. So, listen, you're not the law and order thing of like, I will bring back security. People will not feel secure until the virus is gone and the economy is better. And what they're doing is not facilitating that. So, I think that this is a problem for Trump. And this is very indicative of what a lot of people are thinking. The race is definitely not over yet. Things can still turn around for Trump. But as of right now, if the election was held today, Biden would win and he would win comfortably. And I think that, I do think that, granted, this is a small sample size. It's anecdotal. It's only three people. But what you're seeing there actually is reflected in the broader polls. So, you know, this is indicative of something. This is indicative of a sea change. Maybe people have different reasons for abandoning Trump, but they're definitely abandoning Trump. And, you know, he can press that panic button now because time's running out, big guy. It really is.